the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have played this. On Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and at our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit OnStory.tv. OnStory is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, to all the boys I've loved before writer, Sofia Alvarez. I think if I wasn't a writer, I would be a psychologist because those are the two things I find like most interesting. And I sort of love just listening to people talk about life and their problems. I can't help but find that uh, just life, I guess, in general, really evocative and inspiring. And In this episode, To All the Boys I've Loved Before writer Sofia Alvarez discusses the process of adapting the best-selling young adult novel into a hit romantic comedy. My letters are my most secret possessions. I write them when I have a crush so intense, I don't know what else to do. There are five total. Peter, the most popular guy in school. Kenny from camp. Lucas from homecoming. John Ambrose from Model UN. And Josh, but he's my sister's boyfriend. What are you doing? Nothing. Nobody else knows about them. How did this come to you? So I feel like it's not a very fun story. My agent sent me the book and said, this they want to make this movie, they're looking for a writer. Well, you, you read it, and if you read it and like it, well, you pitch for it. So I read it, I loved it, I thought it was great. So I went in and pitched it and got the job and then wrote it. It was pretty straightforward. <laughs> what was your unique take on it? So I remember in my very first conversation with the producers, before I even... Um, went in to go pitch it, they pretty specifically said, we don't want this to be a movie about a girl who's in love with her sister's boyfriend. And if you read the book, that's a really big part of it. And so while you can't take that out completely, I had to think about like, okay, if it's not a story about that, what is it a story about? And so then something that I thought was a really interesting thing to dig into, particularly for this age group, but kind of for everyone, is this fear of vulnerability um, and this idea that you might believe the idea of who someone is based on your perception of them without thinking about the person they're actually showing you. So if you think about Lara Jean's relationship with Peter, but also, you know, Lara Jean's relationship with herself, I think there are these ideas of this is who this person is or this is who I am. But then when you're actually thinking about the actions that person is taking or the part of you they're showing themselves or what you're doing, it might look a lot different than your initial perception. There aren't these hugely visual moments on the page. It's all the dialogue that's moving everything. And... Is that what you feel was your biggest um, influence as a playwright coming into it? Yeah, dialogue has always been the thing that's come most naturally to me and the thing I have to work at the least. Um, and it's really how I come to understand who the characters are is just by sort of letting them talk to one another and something that I had a lot of fun with into all the boys and... You know, I think particularly in the diner scene where Peter and Lara Jean are talking to one another and they're talking about their parents for the first time, like I really loved that the director and the producers let that scene breathe and let it be as long as it is and let there be as much dialogue in it as there is and almost let certain scenes of this movie 
behave theatrically in the way that there are some longer scenes than you would expect them to be because I think you really get inside like sort of the, the hearts and minds of the characters that way. I remember, especially when I was a teen, um, watching movies and television shows and I felt like they would show a couple coming together and then there would be a montage of like music and that, that's how you knew that they were like bonding and getting along. And I always felt like that's the part I want to be here for. I want to hear what are they saying to yeah. each other? How do people talk to each other? That's the good stuff. Like, why do they like one another? And I totally agree with you. That's the stuff that I'm really interested in. Did you know that uh, my dad left us? Yeah, that was a while ago, right? Uh, two summers ago. He's got a new wife and, and kid now. I'm, I'm so sorry, No, Peter. no, it's, it's fine. It's, I don't usually talk about it. I just. I felt like maybe you'd understand because your mom. Not that it is anywhere near the same no, thing. No, it's totally fine. I completely understand. Yeah, it's it's hard, huh? It's whatever. Well, we don't have to talk about it, but it's not whatever. That is something that I sense in the interplay with your characters on the page, is that you've really studied people and the things that the things that they're saying and the things that they mean. Yeah, well, I'm so happy to hear you say that. I think if I wasn't a writer, I would be a psychologist because those are the two things I find like most interesting. And I sort of love just listening to people talk about life and their problems. And I don't um, approach it from a place of, you know, this is me studying or this is me like watching you, but I can't help but find that uh, just life, I guess, in general, really evocative and inspiring. And, you know, sometimes I would say to my husband, if he'd be like, what are you doing today? And it's a day that, you know, I'm working and be like, well, I'm having coffee with a friend. I'm like, but truly for my job, like every coffee I have with a friend where we're talking about life and problems and like love and expectations and sadness, it's all helpful to me in what I'm doing. First, talk about how you got your start as a writer. Yeah, so um, both of my parents are writers. So it was sort of baked into my childhood. Um, and both of my parents uh, had my siblings and I kind of young, especially by today's standards. Um, like I was the third, and they had me when they were 27. So I saw them becoming professionals as we were growing up. So it wasn't this sort of thing where I was born and they were both established in their careers, they were sort of kind of hustling the whole time that we were growing up. And so I think I always had this idea that you could be a writer, it was an available career path, but that it was going to be hard. And so I never had the sense that, okay, if it's not happening for you right away, it's never gonna happen. What sort of writers were your parents? Were they playwrights? My um, dad was a reporter at the Baltimore Sun for the whole time I was growing up. And, you know, we used to spend a lot of time in the newsroom. And my mom uh, was a science writer the whole time I was growing up, and she worked for Hopkins. And then she wrote a book about the war between animal rights and animal research. And then she wrote a book where she interviewed every prominent transgender person in America, but in 2001. So they're both a little bit like all over the map, but a lot of discussions happening in our house. And it also sounds like you learned, you learned from the beginning that writing isn't, to not necessarily view it as a career where you break in and you do this, it's a way of life. Yeah, but interestingly, it took me a really long time to be comfortable enough, or I guess it's not comfortable, I think it's confident enough to, when someone asks you what you do to say, I'm a writer. Um, which I think is kind of true uh, across the board for all of us, where it's it's kind of a hard bridge to cross. And even when I was, you know, at Juilliard and, and nannying and people would ask me, I think I would say like, well, I'm in grad school. And it wasn't until I was fully making my living being a writer that I felt comfortable saying I'm a writer. But looking back, I think that's a little bit unfair to my younger self. And when I teach something, I tell my students, like, if it's what you're doing, it's what you are. You know, you don't need to be being paid for it, for it to be part of you. But I do think that's a hard lesson to learn. Well, I'm curious about the changes that you made and why, but also were there things that you struggled with? Well, all adaptations are different. And 
for a book like this that has such a loyal fan base, you don't want to make too many changes because you don't want them to not get what they paid for and coming to see the movie adaptation of this book that you love. So I think with these kind of adaptations, you have to have a really soft hand in terms of the changes you do make in ways that make it feel more cinematic, but without taking away from those moments that everyone loves and is looking for and is hoping for. And so I think the thing we talked about a little bit earlier, this idea that we were going to back away from her relationship with Josh, uh, was one of the challenges in that a lot of the conflict in the book comes from that. And so we had to find a way, if it's not about, you know, I'm in love with this guy, but he's my sister's boyfriend, and more about that person was a source of comfort to me and someone I felt at home and myself with, and this person who is a new sort of scarier option um, is someone I have to become comfortable with and let my walls down with, uh, then what is the, the major source of conflict at that sort of end moment when it's all colliding, if it's not this love triangle? Um, and so there's a scene at close to the end of the movie where Margot, the sister, is home and the two boys both come to Lara Jean's house and it's the, I guess, the, the, what you would call the fight scene. Um, and in the book, Laura Jean has kissed Josh, the sister's ex-boyfriend. And so the sister gets really mad because her little sister just kissed her boyfriend. But we were trying to not go down that road. And so how all of these threads connect and making it both a transgression on Laura Jean's part, but not one that can't be easily untied because you don't now want to go into a huge fight with the sister in the third act. Um, those were things that, you know, I think we got there, but it had to be sort of like a delicate dance around all of those different angles. Can we just go inside and talk about this? Yes, you leave, buddy. Josh, I'm fine. Go back inside. No, it's all right. No, it's no, no, right. no, no, no. Are, are you serious right now? Wait, this isn't about Jen and, and me at all. No, this is about you and Josh. Are you kidding me? This is the reason that you broke up with me. You still in love with this Bon Iver wannabe? If Laura Jean broke up with you, it's probably because she's coming to the life-altering revelation that she's too good for you. You're in love with Josh? Margot, no. What classic conventions of romantic comedies did you... Uh, work to stay away from and not want to repeat, and which did you sort of know you had to follow? So I love romantic comedies, as is probably obvious. I, I grew up on them, and When Harry Met Sally is still my favorite movie. I could recite the whole thing from start to finish. Um, and so I don't think that I was actively in the writing of this movie thinking about it that specifically, where I was like, this is something I'm going to attack and this is something I'm going to retreat from. I think it's more that the genre of romantic comedies is kind of in my bones from having watched so many of them. To all the boys, just from the, the plot of the book already has its own romantic comedy convention baked in, which is the, um, you know, pretending to date, but not actually being together and then falling in love with the person you're pretending to date. So that was the one that was obviously, you know, we were, play we were playing with. Um, and so I don't think I was thinking like, what other ones do I want to add or what other ones do I want to not have? Was there anything from the book that you had to let go of for this adaptation? There's this really sweet date that Peter and Laura Jean go on to go antiquing. Um, and then they go get these like chocolate covered donuts. And then in the ski trip in the book, it's those little chocolate covered donuts he brings her to prove that he likes her. And so there was just no room for the antiquing date in the movie, but I wanted to maintain what I thought was really important, which is the idea that he brings her something that she likes. And since I knew I wanted to include the Korean yogurt smoothie earlier in the movie, I thought, well, you could just swap out the chocolate covered donut for the Korean yogurt smoothie, which we've already seen them talk about. So that was sort of a way where you had to lose the antiquing date, but you still got to maintain the thing that was really important story-wise, which that is that he goes out of his way to get her something that she likes. You know, for someone who has such good grades, 
can be so dense sometimes. What? Yeah, I wanted to sit next to you, Large. I even packed the snacks. I asked Kitty where to find those uh, those yogurt drinks you like so much. The Korean grocery store is all the way across town. Yeah, I know. So if I went all the way across town to get you something that you like, then that means... You must really like yogurt? You are impossible. One of the many uh, very special things about this movie is that she is, uh, she and her sisters are half Korean, half white, and it, it's a significant part of who they are and their mother, but it's also not what the movie's then about. I'm curious, like, what was your approach to that? Um, I think I really relied on the book there, but I think also there's something about, they're not, I mean, they are from two different cultures, that's true, but also they're both American teenagers, so they're really not <laughs> from two different cultures uh, in that sense. And so I think that with movies about minority communities, you don't always want it to be that the headline is that you're the other. You just want it to be, you know, this is a romantic comedy that happens to have a young Asian lead but it's a romantic comedy. It's not a romantic comedy about a young Asian lead. Um, and so I think that's just really important to me in general when we're talking about, you know, movies with, with leads of a different ethnicity. Um, I know when my, when my dad was screenwriting, he would get a lot of people who were like, talk about the Hispanic experience. And he would be like, how about this? And he'd pitch me something that was not the experience of our family. And I'd be like, well, why are you pitching that? Because you think it fits this label that someone wants as opposed to saying like, well, it's actually like this, you know, in my house, which is not that different. What to you is the big difference in writing, uh, writing for YA, a YA audience and older audiences? Well, I actually don't think there is much of a difference, um, maybe apart from language, if I'm being honest, because I wrote this to all the boys. One was the first YA project that I did, but I also did this musical for really young audiences, for like elementary school audiences, Amos and Boris, uh, last year. And I think with both of those, if you as the adult writer are not emotionally connected to the story that's being told and the things people are saying, then your audience isn't going to be either, no matter what age they are. So I think the biggest mistake a writer can make when writing for YA audiences is to write down to them. I think they, audiences of all ages are smarter than we give them credit for, and they will be right there with you if you are being truthful to the scenario at hand. And when I was thinking about to all the boys, like, and you asked earlier about like my personal connection to it, I had to go into this book even if, you know, the situations I was writing about were different than my own situation dating in high school. But I had to give these characters the truth of my experience in different ways that I could so that I could feel like I was writing from an emotionally honest place. And I was wagering that if I felt like it represented me, other people would feel like it represented them as well. And so... I think if you're writing from a place where you're saying like, well, this, I've never been there, but who knows, maybe someone else has, or I don't know what it's like to be in this scenario. You have to find the part of yourself that connects in whatever way, and then write from there. And that's helped me in writing for all ages. Were there any uh, scenes or moments that you pulled from your own experiences? I don't, I wouldn't call it specific scenes or moments. Um, there, there are a couple in the sequel that that's true for, but in the first one, I'm trying to think. I think it was more about a feeling of what it was like to date in high school. I remember thinking, especially being a young woman, that there's this idea that you're the one who, who can get hurt and you don't necessarily think about the ways the boys are being hurt too if you're if you're thinking about heterosexual high school relationships because i think all the stories we're told from the time we're young are that 
the boys, especially boys like Peter Kavinsky, who are like, have had a girlfriend and are super popular and the king of the school are sort of bulletproof. Like there's nothing you could do as this kind of outsider like Laura Jean that might make them feel vulnerable or afraid or like they're not living up to a certain expectation. And so I think one of the things that I was trying to attack in the adaptation is and I talked about this a little bit earlier with thinking about the idea of the person as opposed to what they're actually showing you, is she thinks that she's the only one who's capable of getting hurt in this scenario. And one of the things she has to learn throughout the movie is that he has a fear of being vulnerable too. And I think that's something that I pulled from my own experience of dating in high school, whereas I wasn't giving the boys in my life enough credit for being on the same page as me in that. Every guy, you know, gets a little bit obsessed with their first, you know, wow, chicken wow, no. wow. Yeah. Okay, let's look at the facts, shall we? The whole fake relationship was his idea. You came up with the no kissing rule, and you're the one who keeps trying to break up with him, and you're also the one who's currently carb loading with a gay man while he's probably waiting for you in the hot tub. So I'd say, if there's anyone who stupidly fell for somebody who doesn't like them back, it's not you, it's Kavinsky. You think he's waiting for me in the hot tub? <laughs> Hell yeah. I feel like that's also a big difference though with YA and, you know, say writing adults, is that lack of perspective. You just don't have it yet. And everything I try to write, I love to, approach all the characters from a place of good intentions. Cause I think things get a lot messier um, in a way that's harder to untie when everyone sort of has good intentions. And then you have to come to a place of understanding knowing that everyone was trying their best as opposed to, I wanted to hurt you. And so I hurt you for some, you know, Machiavellian reason. Uh, for example, in Into All the Boys, in the book, the younger sister sends out the letters from a place of spite or wanting to hurt her older sister. And in the movie, I really wanted her to send out the letters from a place of trying to help her older sister. A, because we have less real estate in the movie than in the book to show, you know, all the ways in which these sisters love each other. So I just wanted to keep it, you know, warm throughout. But I have a secret too. I sent the letters. I'm gonna kill you. No, 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 no. He's a kid! He's just, you look so lonely, and I can tell Peter liked you. I don't know you would do anything about it. So you just sent all five of them? I thought five chances at a boyfriend was better on. Oh my God. I'm gonna tell him come over for dinner. All right. Give me the unicorn. Look, her logic was off but her heart was in the right place. Her face is gonna be in the wrong place. There are good intentions behind every action for all of the characters, including Jen. Um, there's that scene in the bathroom at the end uh, where Lara Jean has to come to understand that though she thought she was, couldn't have been further from someone Jen was thinking about, actually all of her actions were really affecting this girl who she thought didn't care about her a bit. And that was really important to me too, that the relationships between the women were as complicated and intense as the relationships between, as the romantic relationships in the book. You know, it's bad enough if a guy were to do this, but the fact that a girl did, I mean, that's despicable. Yeah, like I said, I didn't do it. <laughs> you know what? I'm really glad that someone did though. Because finally, everyone is going to see who you really are. What are you talking about? Peter! He is not as confident as he pretends to be. I am not as tough as I pretend to be. And you, Lara Jean Covey, you are not as innocent as you pretend to be. Because you kissed the boy that I liked. Jen, you guys are broken up. No, 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 before, before we even dated. Are you talking about middle school? You knew that I liked him, and you kissed him anyway. It was spin the bottle, you psycho, and it was tongueless. Okay, well, it wasn't tongueless to me. Um, so in writing to all the boys I've loved before, what was the most difficult part and the most rewarding part of um, adapting it? I think the part I like the most is 
reading a story and then thinking about that question, what's my way in? Uh, I think that's really fun and thinking about like how you are like not just the protagonist in the story, but all of the characters in the story. Um, that's something that I just find really enjoyable and one of the reasons I really like doing adaptations. You've been watching on writing to all the boys I've loved before on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program, the On Story podcast, and the On Story book series, available where books are sold. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. See On Story Live? Join us at Austin Film Festival's annual Writers Conference each October. Visit www.austinfilmfestival.com to find out more about badges and passes to attend the festival.